the laborers are few, but don't let that stop you. Dear God, we thank you for this moment. And now may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be found acceptable in your sight. God, you are our strength and you are our redeemer in Jesus' name. Amen. In every congregation that I've been privileged to serve over the last 30 years, whether it was being allowed to serve by God's grace in a pastoral role or as a lay person, most of these congregations numbering between 120 and 350 members, there have always been a core group of members, perhaps 20 to 25 people, more or less, who did the bulk of the congregation's ministry planning and work via boards, committees, ad hocs, and by using their elbow grease. Also, a slightly larger circle maybe 30 to 50 members, depending on the size of the congregation, help to carry financially the entire work of the ministry through their consistent giving of tithes and offerings. And then, and then a much smaller number, maybe seven to 10 people, were willing to regularly and visibly share their faith in Jesus Christ and publicize the work of the congregation beyond the four walls of the congregation in an organized and systematic manner with others in the community. They would share the word of God and the good news about the congregation. And they were sharing with people oftentimes whom they did not previously no, about seven to 10 members. So in congregations from 120 to 350, you might have 20 to 25 who were core members, who had a passion to volunteer for committees and subcommittees and other tasks to do in the congregation's ministry program. And 30 to 50 members or giving units who were carrying the brunt of the financial burden of the entire congregation. And finally, when it came to going out and sharing literature about Christ, the congregation and prayers with those who actually lived in the neighborhood community, the community of the congregation, there were maybe seven to 10 mem members max. All of these small percentages out of 120 to 350 members. The people engine that made each congregation work and run and move was always much smaller than the overall body. Well, sisters and brothers, this phenomenon is not new. In fact, according to Jesus in our text, this is part and parcel of how religious institutions, especially the church, the American church, has functioned since the founding of this country. And then the church in general, many branches of it have functioned like this since the days of Jesus Christ. In our text in Luke chapter 10, Jesus himself declared this many, many, many years ago when he told his disciples, 70 whom he had just appointed, out of the large throngs of people who would attend his revivals and his healing and teaching services and who would listen to whatever words came out of his mouth and his invitation to walk with God and follow him. Only 82 total, 70 and then the 12, out of what could have been a regular crowd of 8,200, who sometimes attended his rallies about the kingdom of God would become the actively engaged workers and servants who were concerned about harvest time and willing to directly involve themselves in the work of collecting God's harvest of people. They were few then and they are few now. 
Though, according to what Jesus says, when he says the harvest is ready, though people in the community were ready to have God encounters, though people in the surrounding cities and towns and hamlets were ready to hear about God, how God operates in the world, though Jesus suggested that people were ready to be transformed by their encounter with God's holy love so that they would be given a new perspective, a new hope, new dreams, new power, far greater than the dying power of the Roman Empire and far greater than that of the temple-based religion which ruled the day, which did not satisfy nor save as Jesus would and could. Though folk in the surrounding towns and hamlets were ready to turn their lives over to God and become transformed nonconformists, as Dr. King described, transformed by a personal, personal and social gospel, not conforming to this world system, Jesus also noted that though there's so many people who are ready, there aren't many laborers. Not many folk in the faith community who were willing to be anointed and appointed by the Lord and become change agents who were willing to interact with familiar folk and unfamiliar folk in a way that was visible and bold out on the front lines of church and community relations. Why might this be, I wonder? Why so few? Too many distractions, perhaps? Too many people with good intentions, but bad follow through, maybe? Jesus said that the harvest is plentiful and ready to be picked and collected and put in bags. But the laborers show up in small numbers to do the work that God has for us to do. Rick Warren, you all remember Rick Warren, right? The pastor uh, of that wonderful church, Saddleback Church. He described in his book, The Purpose Driven Church, years ago, that most of our congregations in this country are surrounded by a community, a neighborhood. On any given Sunday, worshipers are made up of attendees who come from the community or they are members who attend from time to time. He calls these folk the crowd. So you got the community, you got the crowd. And then within the crowd, you have a congregation, folk whose names are on the rolls and they show up periodically and they invest in the congregation to a degree. And then within the congregation, he said, you have the committed who tithe, who might attend uh, very frequently. And then you have those amid the committed who are living at the core of the ministry and spiritual life of the congregation. At the most central level is the core, are those who are willing to study God's word together and then internalize God's word to make disciples and then are willing to go back out beyond the committed, beyond the congregation, beyond the crowd, into the community to help God recruit, recruit new core disciples. Are you a part of the community, the crowd, the congregation, the committed, or, or the core? The good news is God loves folks at every level. However, only the core will experience certain sp precious spiritual adventures. Let me say that again. Only the core will experience certain precious spiritual adventures only reserved for those God anoints and appoints to help directly bring people into the kingdom or the kingdom of God. The spirit of God is always trying to coax and persuade and recruit and convince more of us to move from the crowd to the core 
to become laborers who are willing to go back out into the vineyards of the world and win people to Jesus and to help save those who don't know Christ and tell others that he is the king of a glorious kingdom. Not a kingdom of hate, not a kingdom of suspicion and paranoia and authoritarian rule and racism and classism and a whole lot of other isms. But he is profoundly the good king, the great king, the only king ultimately worth following. And together, the king and the kingdom want to heal more, deliver more people, cleanse more people, and bring more into the fellowship of God's presence and goodness. Hence, Jesus said to those who had already started laboring, Y'all have put your hands to the plow and you're few, but now what I want you to do is pray. Pray to the Lord of the harvest. Pray that the Lord would successfully recruit others to send them out in turn into the harvest because people are ready to change. And though you are few, don't let that stop you. And sisters and brothers, this is the crux of our message this morning. The laborers are few, but don't let that stop you. And it is directed, especially to those who have just started making that move from being just a part of the church crowd to becoming the committed and then being a part of God's core. It is also directed toward all of those who have been laboring for a long time in a systematic and organized way to share about Jesus and your church community. Yes, this message is directed especially to the 20 to 25 committed members who plan and work the bulk of ministry. And it is primarily directed to the 30 to 50 committed members who may or may not work the bulk of ministry, but who are committed to diligently supporting the financial infrastructure of this congregation as you attend regularly. Even when their money is funny and their strange is change and inflation is high. But you have committed to put your money where your faith is anyway. And lastly, this word is directed to the seven to 10 core members who in a variety of ways, with a variety of gifts, have been the main servant leaders of the congregation who study God's word and then are willing to export their faith and tell the story about somebody who can save anybody, anywhere, anytime. Some of you have titles, others of you might not have one title. This message is primarily for you though today. And the rest of us from the community to the crowd, we can listen. We can tune in and see what God is trying to say to these core members. And the first point is this, don't stop doing what God has called you to do just because you are in the minority in terms of numbers that we can quantify. Okay, let me repeat that. If you are a part of the core or the committed, don't stop doing what God has called you to do just because you are in the minority in terms of numbers that we can quantify. Don't base your spiritual energy and vitality in service to God solely on the numbers of others who may or may not come alongside you for a variety of reasons. Instead of looking to others, instead of looking to your neighbors and your sister and brother and them, comparing yourself with others, make sure that your energy, your enthusiasm, your effort, are all rooted in your relationship with God, inspired by your intimate time with the Lord and in how God has equipped you and anointed and appointed you. Stop looking at other folk. We praise God for the group and the tribe. We thank God for the philosophy of Ubuntu, which is the notion that because we are, I am, and I am, and we are together. 
We thank God for Ubuntu. We thank God for community. We thank God for the village. However, in every life, there comes a point when we have to be individually anchored in the Lord. And we cannot be laser focused on what others are or not doing for the Lord. And we can't just count numbers, but we have to be committed to making numbers count. Have I got a witness? In almost every way, I am a proponent of the social gospel. Dr. King believed in the social gospel. I believe that the word of God requires us to think communally about how God is at work, not just in me, not just in any one individual, but how God is at work and desires to be at work in us, in the neighborhood, in the city. I believe that Ubuntu is an important principle that is African, but also universal in nature. The tribe is important in shaping individual identity and purpose. However, there are those times when we can always look to see what everyone else is doing in order to map out our own behavior and practices. We are going to have to give an account to God for what we have done both collectively, but also individually. In a parable in Matthew chapter 25, Jesus commended the five wise virgins to be for making sure that they kept their own individual lamps filled with oil. While at the same time, he called foolish the many others who did not keep their lamps trimmed with oil. Those who had not kept inventory of their oil and squandered their spiritual resources came at the critical moment running to the wise uh, women, the wise brides, and said to them, give us some of your oil. But at that point, with the groom coming, they had to look out for themselves. And they said, you better run down to Walmart and get your own oil. I added the Walmart part, but read the story in Matthew 25. They had to look out for themselves. The laborers are few, but don't let that stop you. No matter who is around you, not willing to labor for the Lord in the church and beyond, no matter who around you is playing church and not being the church for real, no matter who around you is willing to be irresponsible and enjoy the benefits of the minorities of the church who are carrying the church, no matter who around you is enjoying the events, the fellowship opportunities, the technological support through streaming and taping and publishing our services online without making commitments themselves, no matter who is willing to ride your coattails as a laborer, as a tither, as a person in the community sharing the good news, and they never seem to volunteer themselves, they never seem to engage as you and others are trying to engage God. Don't let that stop you. Don't get puffed up either. Don't think that you're better than other people. Don't think that you're greater than other members. Don't think that you're more holy than other members. I think it was Beyonce who's, who, who she said in her song, Irreplaceable, that you can be replaced. We can be replaced. We're not that big and great before God. It's by the mercies of God that God allows us to be a part of the core and the committed. In fact, Jesus said, don't get lifted up about it. Pray for others in your church. We read the text. Pray that God would raise up more laborers, that God would turn the inactive into the active, the fence strappers into fence leapers, promise breakers into promise keepers. And then after you've taken a deep breath and gotten your mind together, you just keep it moving with your eyes fixed on Jesus, doing what he's called you to do. Jesus said that though the harvest is ready to be harvested, the laborers are few. Calvary, Calvary, here's something important for us to keep our eyes on as a committed and active member. Note that Luke writes in the text that out of the hundreds of and thousands of folk 
in the region of Galilee and the cities and towns and hamlets that made up that region, Jesus did indeed appoint seven. That's good news. He did appoint 70. He appointed, he appointed them. That, that's great news because Jesus is still in the appointing business. It wasn't the 7,000 who were anointed and appointed, though Jesus invited as many as he could to follow him, but 70 were indeed appointed by God. And they were appointed because at some point they were willing to be recruited and taught and then appointed. They were ready to be trained. 70 out of the 7,000 had the right outlook and were connected enough to the Lord that even though he saw them flaws and all, deficits and all, the 70 had their own shortcomings and all, he still targeted them to be anointed and appointed. Isn't that good news for you? Because we got our flaws. We got our hangups. We got our dysfunctional qualities. We've got our quirks. And yet God is still in the calling business. Oh, that's shouting news right there. The 70 were ready to join the 12 and go deeper in an adventure with God. And that is good news for someone who has been laboring for the Lord for a while. I just want to remind you and encourage you with what Luke reminds us of. Jesus has looked out upon you. And by his grace and mercy, not because you had it all together all the time, but because you took an interest in the things of the kingdom, you have been anointed and appointed by the grace of God. Jesus himself has anointed and appointed you. That's why you take some matters of church seriously. It's not just you, but it's what the Holy Spirit is doing in your heart. The original Greek word translated as appointed in this verse meant exhibit. He wanted to exhibit and display, put on display the 70. Jesus displayed them. Jesus exhibited them. The 70 were appointed and put on display. Not as high monthly monks, not as the aristocrats of the church, but as light bearers, as carriers of the gospel and bearers of compassion and love and healing and wisdom. The 70 were appointed. They were put on display as chosen vessels of honor and service. And if you have something percolating on the inside of you, wanting to move from the crowd to the core, not just in this church, but in the work of the broad kingdom of God, then it is because you are being anointed and appointed. God is putting you on display. He's beginning that process. Display for service so that you might effectuate change beginning in here, but ultimately for purposes that are out there. You are not appointed and anointed just to bless people in this church. You are anointed and appointed to bless people beyond this church whom you don't know. So remember the number, remember the numbers of the core will always be few, but don't get discouraged. Point number two, the few who are moving toward the core are being anointed and appointed by the Lord for his purposes. So we've covered that. We covered point number one, that there'll always be few who are moving toward the core. But third and last point, Jesus gives those, the few, he gives those who are anointed and appointed, training instructions rooted in his word, a divine method and plan to help heal and transform the lives of others. Rooted in his word, the plan is. A method and plan to work on that we have to work on without distraction. Okay, let me, let me see if I can fix that up a little bit better. Jesus, the third point is, Jesus, for those who are committed and the core, he then wants to instruct us and give us a method and a plan to making that method, that, that plan happen. And the plan always involves 
healing others, and transforming the lives of others. In our text, in essence, Jesus says to the 70 and the core, you can check me against the word of God. He said, look, this is my version of it. I have a task for you to focus on. I don't want you to get distracted. I need you to accomplish this work. And it will have one overarching message that you are to share with the masses. Go around two by two, declaring everywhere that you go that the kingdom of God is in your midst, that the kingdom of God is within your grasp. And later, I'm going to visit each place where you have been proclaiming this message, and I'm going to show up myself and clarify the message and make sure that everybody knows I'm the king about whom you were talking about. And as you go, do know that not everyone is going to be receptive to your message. In fact, that's why you need a certain methodology as you share this message. Because in fact, I'm sending you out as a sheep among wolves. And there will be instances where as you go, where I will send you, you are going to end up criticized, stigmatized, rejected, renounced, and then by the instructions of my father, you are to wipe the dust off your feet as a testimony against them. But you just say, focus. And then everything that he shares with them afterwards were superlative instructions to help them to stay focused. Oh, yes, the laborers are few, but the laborers have to maintain focus. Yes, we might not have the numbers in terms of how the world counts, but we have to stay focused anyway. You know, um, I remember close family members of mine, they have now passed away. They lived in a certain house in Indianapolis and they lived right across the street from a Mennonite congregation. That's a mainline congregation which believes in nonviolence and peace and the congregation was a mixed congregation. It sat on the corner right across the street from them. I guess that congregation expected uh, my family members to visit the congregation. And that's the way they would encounter the gospel. But one day, a team of white Pentecostal charismatics started visiting the neighborhood, some of whom were older, about the age of my family members. And then as they knocked on the door, they were invited in and they started talking about the gospel with my family members. Lo and behold, two months later, though these were white folk and my family members were suspicious of white people and they had reached that age. Though they were not Pentecostal or charismatic, they ended up, one of whom had never been baptized as a much older man, ended up being baptized and he came up out of that water speaking in tongues. Now, I don't know what you or, or what where your belief is about glossolalia, and that's not the point. The point is, there was just a few, a group, a team who was willing to go out, and they came upon fertile ground, though there was these cultural dis differences, though there were these ethnic differences, they still shared, and it made a difference in my family member's life. Oh, sisters and brothers, we've got to keep going and not be distracted. Jesus says in a variety of ways in our text, stay focused, though you are few, keep loving, keep proclaiming that God is near and that the kingdom of God is near. Stay focused. As I close, this is the gist of why Jesus instructs them to do the way that they do as they're carrying out ministry. He wants the few who are faithful, the few who are really invested, the core, the 70, maybe you, maybe me, not to get sidetracked. We can hear what he says to them, updated and extrapolated and translated and bring it into 2022 and beyond. He says, work God's plan and stay focused. Okay, how does he say that preacher? Well, first he says, look, don't carry a money bag with you. Am I in the Bible? As you do the work, don't carry your purse. 
In other words, he was saying to them, don't carry the kind of baggage with you that as you are thinking about ministry, that the first thought comes to your head is how much money is it going to cost? What kind of resources do we have? When God calls you and your crew to do something for the Lord, the first question should never be how much will it cost? The question should be how much will it cost us spiritually if we don't do it? The question should be, if I do this thing, then God is going to miraculously show up or in some very pragmatic ways, God's going to show up and give us everything we need. So I'm just looking up to daddy and I'm looking to see how God is going to make this thing work. Let the question of material cost be the last question or the final question. I know it's got to be asked, but not at the outset. The first question is, what is God calling us to do for this corridor? What is God calling us to do for singles, for married folk, for seniors, for youth, for the disabled, for those not registered to vote, for those who need a voice? That is the first question. Don't focus on bringing the perks first. Then he says, because he's trying to keep them focused, don't carry extra sandals. As if to say, for this ministry mission you are on today, I need you to downsize. No need to bring extra sandals, extra clothing, and extra material possession. You know, that's hard for us. As you walk through this period in your life, you want you went on one cruise this year already. Maybe a second one is not in order. I'm just saying, I'm not trying to tell you how to spend your money. But God does say to us, spend your energies not on planning our second vacation, but on our first men's and women's retreat in 2023. You bought one 70 inch TV last year. No reason to double up right now. At least put it off for 24 months. Put the extra savings, put the extra toward someone who needs some help. Put the extra in the offering plate. Leave the second pair of sandals at home. They will be there waiting for you for another time. And then Jesus says to the 70, don't greet folk. And this was puzzling. And I'm almost done. Don't greet folk as you walk along the roadway into town. Why does Jesus say this? This is strange advice. After all, as the Reverend Dr. Stephanie Crowder, a good friend of mine, writes in her commentary on the book of Luke in the African-American New Testament commentary, she said that disciples at that time had to rely on the hospitality of strangers, just like our ancestors who were part of the Underground Railroad. And they had to rely on the kindness of strangers to make it. So why is Jesus saying that we need to leave good manners behind as we give ourselves over to the work of ministry? Should, shouldn't we become kinder as we go out into strange areas? Is Jesus saying that we should be rude? No, this is not what Jesus is saying. In fact, if we read down further, we will learn that as these traveling saints on this mission make it to different cities, they will be lodging in homes. Homes of people they are just getting to know. And I know, and you know, that we can't expect to lodge in anybody's home with whom we don't speak especially folk we don't previously know, we've got to greet them. We've got to have conversations with them and find out are they spiritual and willing to, to be quiet allies and put up some evangelists who need lodging. So what is Jesus really saying here? I think Jesus is saying, when you have committed to serving the Lord in whatever capacity, watch very carefully your social life and your socializing and your appetite to socialize. Have in check your desires to always meet and greet and socialize here, there, and everywhere. I know that some of us are introverts and that makes this easy, but others of us are extroverts 
And God can use both introverts and extroverts to do God's work in a serious way. God just doesn't want us to get caught up and lose sight of the overarching purposes of our lives. God doesn't want us to get to the end of our lives. And we've attended party after party, social after social, event after event. And we did not put our hands with the same gusto to the work of the Lord. So don't get distracted, so distracted by socializing and mingling with the world that you forget, that we forget, that we are here to offer a clear word of hope and judgment, healing and prophetic consequences. Keep your focus on God's plan, working that plan, not on people, not on social entanglements, not on club after club, not on just hanging with the girls or the guys who are a part of your sorority and fraternity. And there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong if you prayed about it in being a Mason or an Eastern star or part of the boule, each in its place, each in moderation. But above all, sisters and brothers, if you want to be a part of God's core, with deliberate pace, we are to make our mission and focus clear. Oh, sisters and brothers, I knew this wasn't going to be a shouting message, but I think it's a timely message. We who are committed and a part of the core will always be in the minority, but we can't focus on counting numbers. We have to make numbers count. Jeremiah Wright tells a story. It's in a book which really explicates the history of the formation of the Trinity Church of Christ. He tells the story of what happened in the first one or two years of his ministry in that congregation. While there, he was trying to help the congregation live into its vision and mission that it had created about four years earlier. Reuben Shears, the Reverend Reuben Shears had been the interim minister and he took the congregation through a process where they said, we're going to be unashamedly black and unapologetically Christian. That's going to be our mission and vision. Everything we do is going to surround and revolve around being unashamedly black and unapologetically Christian. Everything we do. So right is called to the congregation. He looks over the vision. He says, we're going to take this thing seriously. So because he had a background in music, one of the first thing he noticed is that the music was totally Eurocentric. They were singing like pilgrims who had come over into the new world. The Congregational Church, which is a part of the United Church, uh, the United Church of Christ, was rooted in the pilgrims' story. And he noticed they were singing those kind of hymns, those kind of songs. So he went out after getting approval by the board a hymnal that was non-denominational and it had a whole lot of black gospel in it. Well, do you know what happened? Members of the congregation started complaining. Rumors went out that he had bought these uh, hymns, these hymn books with the church's money without approval. Others were making motions and meetings saying, we need to make him pay for these hymns. None of it was true. And people started to leave the congregation first because of the issue of hymnals and because he said, as we study the Bible together, we want our leaders in Bible study so that they can become biblically fluent and know the language and the concepts behind the Bible. And we're going to look at it from a black perspective. Then you had a few scores of other folk leave. He became so despondent after his first year and a half that he couldn't sleep one night. He got on the phone, he had done the math in his mind. I'm telling you, we gotta make numbers count right. He did the math in his mind and he said, we've lost 60 folk this year. He called up Reuben Shears, the interim pastor. He said, I can't sleep. I don't know what to do. I thought my ministry in Christ would be successful. People are leaving the church. He said, Reuben Shears listened and said, well, do you know your current membership numbers? How many have joined? 
He said, no, I, I don't know. He said, well, get with the secretary, check with her, see how many had joined, 1972. He did this the next day, found out that over 120 people had joined that year. So he went back to Reuben Shears and said, listen, I'm excited now. 120 folk joined and I didn't even realize it because the 60 were at the utmost point in my thinking. And he said to Reverend Wright, listen, I'm going to give you this advice and give it to you once. You pastor the 120 new folk and the folk who remain and let the other ones find another pastor. What was Wright's problem? He was using the wrong kind of math. Sisters and brothers, we got to use God's mathematical equations. We've got to use God's algebraic equations. When we're thinking about the kingdom of God, we might be few, but we can be powerful. It might not be many of us, but God looks at the number thing differently. We've just got to remain faithful and focused because the laborers are indeed few. But don't let that stop you. Maybe there's one here today. You are motivated to move from the crowd to the committed to the core. It starts with you giving your life to Jesus Christ. Maybe there's one here today. You want to give your life to Jesus Christ. He will make your life brand new. What he has done for others, he will do for you. As we stand, won't you come? And if you're online, maybe you need to give your life to Jesus for the first time. Or you need to recommit your life. Or you desire to join Calvary Presbyterian. I recommend our church to it. Won't you call the number 537-2590, leave a message, ask to speak to the leaders.